Coming up on this Thursday edition of Daybreak, racially charged protests flare up again in Ferguson and other US cities over a decision not to proceed in a case involving the killing of a black teenager by a white police officer. As it prepares for its generational handover of power, Samsung Group says it's selling its chemicals and defence businesses to Hanwha Group for roughly 1.3 billion US dollars. Plus, Korea says four doctors and six nurses will make up its medical team that'll help in global efforts to tackle Ebola in West Africa. The team, which will stay for three months, will arrive in Sierra Leone late next month. Daybreak begins now. Hello and thanks for joining us. To our viewers around the world, it's 6 a.m. on Thursday, November 27th here in Seoul. I'm Mark Broom and you're tuned in to Daybreak. Our top story this morning, Korea's largest conglomerate, Samsung Group, is selling its chemicals and defence affiliates to Hanwha Group as Samsung preps for a leadership succession. The sales are part of a massive restructuring plan that will see control steadily shift from current chairman Lee Gon Hee to his son and the group's heir apparent Lee Jae Young. Lee Ji Yoon reports. Two of Korea's biggest conglomerates have agreed on a 1.7 billion U.S. dollar deal. On Wednesday, Samsung Group said it will sell its controlling stakes in four of its affiliates to Hanwha Group. Considering Samsung hasn't sold off an entire business to a domestic rival for nearly two decades, the news is a big deal to many. Samsung is selling its defense businesses, Samsung Techwin and Samsung Talus, along with its chemical units, Samsung General Chemicals and Samsung Total Petrochemicals, to Hanwha. However, it is keeping Samsung Fine Chemicals and Samsung BP Chemicals. These are the ones that make materials for rechargeable batteries and liquid crystal display. With this deal, Samsung Group is looking to pull out from its defense and chemical businesses. Instead, it's going to focus more on its core businesses to bring in more profits. They include electronics, financial services, engineering, and construction. Experts say Samsung is taking aggressive steps toward restructuring, doing away with affiliates that don't improve the group's competitiveness. They add the company also seems to be getting ready to transfer the group's ownership to the next generation of the family, considering its head Egon Hee remains in hospital after suffering a heart attack in May. With the purchase, Hana Group will jump up the ladder to become Korea's ninth largest conglomerate. Lee Jun, Arirang News. Now, following hot on the heels of downward revisions by several local think tanks, foreign investment banks have also lowered Korea's growth forecast for next year. Bloomberg says 34 major foreign institutions, including Moody's and HSBC, cut Korea's growth outlook for 2015, putting the market median at 3.6%. That's nearly half a percentage point lower than the Korean government's goal of 4%. The bankers blamed slumping domestic demand coupled with unfavorable external factors, including Japan's monetary easing on next year's exports. And more disappointing economic news because Korea's consumer sentiment has dropped to its lowest point in more than one year this month, despite government efforts to prop up the ailing economy. Uh, Hwang Jie has the details. The Korean government is trying to boost economic sentiment through a set of aggressive stimulus measures, but those efforts are not bearing fruit, not yet at least. The Bank of Korea says the country's consumer sentiment index came in at 103 this month, down two points from a month earlier. The figure is even lower than the level recorded just after the Seolho ferry sinking in April, a tragedy that seriously dented private consumption. The central bank says the drop in this month's index largely stems from sluggish domestic demand and worsening global economic conditions like the weakening Japanese yen and the U.S. Federal Reserve cutting back its stimulus measures. Experts add that the lowered growth forecast of major institutions also dragged down sentiment.
Korea's central bank, considered one of the most credible institutions, has cut its growth forecast for the domestic economy for next year. And although the government hasn't given out its new official outlook, there are expectations that it's also going to trim its projection. Despite the drop, a reading above 100 indicates that optimists still outnumber pessimists. The monthly index reflects the overall economic outlook of consumers, their living conditions and future spending plans. To push up consumer sentiment in the long term, experts say raising the country's income level is critical, adding that the government's expansionary policies are only a short term solution. Hwang Jie, Arirang News. Now, more women in Korea are giving up their careers, their working lives, because of either marriage, pregnancies, or just taking care of their kids at home. New data from Statistics Korea shows nearly 2 million women, especially those in their 30s and 40s, were not working as of April of this year for those very reasons. Despite government efforts to help more women stay in the workforce, that figure is up 1% or 22,000 from last year. Women who quit their jobs due to either marriage, pregnancies or child rearing make up more than a fifth of all married women in Korea. Korea's poor are getting poorer, this according to latest government data, and the government has put in policies uh, to try and narrow this gap, but these have failed by and large. Our Konsoa reports. The gap between the haves and have-nots in Korea is widening, while government efforts are not efficiently improving income distributions. Korea's poverty gap last year was 36.4 percent, up nearly one percentage point from 2012 and nearly two percentage points from the year before. Statistics Korea says households that earn less than half of the country's median household income accounted for 18.9 percent of all households last year. But the government's tax, welfare and other policies managed to reduce the number of households falling below the poverty line by 2.5 percentage points. The effect of the government policies, however, was disappointing when compared with progresses made in other OECD nations. In 2011 alone, taxation and other government steps made an improvement of nearly 32 percentage points in Ireland, where less than 10 percent of households fell below poverty line. Government measures in France, Finland and Germany all made improvements of more than 20 percentage points. The improvement in Korea for that year was just 2.1 percentage points. Experts say Korea's income redistribution policies produced poorest effects among OECD nations. It's crucial to collect higher taxes for higher income people and distribute the money to the poor. That must be strengthened in Korea. The analyst added that the nation has to come up with better incentives and other supporting measures to help bolster spending powers of households in the low-income bracket. Kwon Soa, Arirang News. Korea is going to send its first full-scale medical team to Ebola-hit Sierra Leone in the coming weeks, making sure they are prepared for any eventuality. Officials' focus now is on what to do if one of the team were to catch the deadly virus during their roughly three-month-long mission. Our Kim ji reports. Korea has finalized the details of a medical support team that will be sent to Ebola hit Sierra Leone next month. Seoul's foreign ministry says it will deploy a group of 10. That includes four doctors and six nurses. They're scheduled to depart on December 13th and first head to a British Ebola treatment facility near London for training. Their medical work in Sierra Leone will start on December 29th and it's expected that they'll stay there for three months. We selected Sierra Leone due to their high number of Ebola patients. The virus is spreading at a fast pace, faster than in Liberia. And the recovery rate of those infected is also high in Sierra Leone. So we thought our help would be most effective there. 
The ministry is also preparing for worst-case scenarios. In the event a team member contracts the Ebola virus, the ministry is considering transporting the victim on a U.S.-run private airliner to a facility in Europe for treatment. They would not be sent to Korea due to concerns that the long flight could worsen their condition. Once their mission in Sierra Leone is complete, all team members will be quarantined in Korea for 21 days to make sure they're Ebola free. The ministry says it's considering sending three separate teams to West Africa next year, each composed of 10 people for similar efforts. Korea dispatched a team to Sierra Leone earlier this month to conduct site inspections of medical facilities there. Kim Jeon, Arirang News. Now for a look at the latest from what's been happening over in the U.S. with the uh, protests over there, over that ruling in Ferguson and the rest of the global headlines we're following at this hour on Thursday morning here in Seoul. As always, we turn to our Eunice Kim, who's standing by for us at the News Center. Hello, Eunice. Good morning to you, Mark. Protesters poured into streets across the United States and in parts of the world, denouncing that decision to not indict the white police officer that shot dead an unarmed black teenager. In New York City, a massive group marched through Union Square, the United Nations, Times Square to Harlem, blocking traffic and demanding change. In Los Angeles, parts of two busy freeways, the I-5 and the 101, were shut down for a time when protesters blocked lanes. Protests were also planned for Oslo, London and Tokyo, according to a website set up to organize the efforts. And in an exclusive interview with ABC News, Officer Darren Wilson broke his silence and said he had a clean conscience because he knew he did his job right. The 20-year-old also said that Michael Brown's shooting was the first time he had fired his gun during the less than three years he was with the Ferguson police force. Brown's mother, Leslie McSpadden, said she was said, or rather, she said that Officer Wilson's interview was disrespectful and added insult to injury. Attorneys for the Brown family said they would push federal charges against Wilson, alleging the grand jury process was rigged from the start. And new European Commission President Jean-Claude Juncker unveiled a massive investment plan to kickstart the ailing EU economy. At the center of his $393 billion plan is channeling money into infrastructure projects. The EU budget will put up the initial $20 billion, with the rest of it coming from large private investors, insurance companies and pension funds. The Commission said the plan to boost broadband, transport, education and research infrastructures would create up to 1.3 million new jobs. Critics, though, are skeptical about the private investment heavy plan. And tensions remain between Russia and the West. And in the latest criticism, German Chancellor Angela Merkel accused Moscow of violating the peace in Europe for its actions in Ukraine. During a lower house debate, Chancellor Merkel said NATO was not ruling out sending more support to Kiev, including the delivery of lethal weapons. But she also offered an olive branch of sorts on Wednesday, trade talks between the EU and Russia-led economic bloc in hopes to cool tensions. Russia's President Vladimir Putin said Russia is not a threat to anyone and does not intend to get involved in geopolitical games or conflicts. Finally, a panel of EU watchdogs say Google needs to expand its right to be forgotten to its international site that ends with a .com, saying it's necessary to prevent law from being circumvented. The right to be forgotten was established back in May with the EU Court of Justice ruling, which said a Spaniard had the right to have his past financial troubles erased from Google results. The popular search engine currently delists results on its European version, but not its international one. We start before the sun rises to bring you the latest stories out of Korea. We also lead the way with important global coverage. Stay on the pulse of what is happening with Daybreak.
China has expressed its deep opposition to the possible deployment of a U.S. long-range missile defense system here on the Korean Peninsula. The Chinese ambassador to South Korea, Chu Guo Hong, says the move would negatively impact South Korea-China relations. He added the deployment would harm China's security system as the so-called U.S. Terminal High Altitude Defense Battery, or as it's also known, THAAD, has a range of about 2,000 kilometers, putting it well in the range of China. The ambassador said Beijing is worried the system could go beyond targeting only North Korean missiles. There has been speculation Seoul is planning to let the U.S. deploy this system here, but South Korea insists that it's currently developing its own low-altitude missile defences. President Park Geun-hye has been busy promoting the benefits of having a healthy body and mind, saying a physically active nation is a powerful nation. Marking the government's monthly culture day, the president visited Olympic Park in eastern Seoul on Wednesday, where she joined officials and citizens in some gymnastics-based exercises. You can also see her there playing table tennis with some members of the public. She looks pretty good. Referring to Koreans' increasing life ex expectancy, President Park said never having, uh, rather, having a healthy post-retirement lifestyle has never been so important. She added that by exercising more, citizens uh, should be able to save on medical expenses in later life. North Korea has now got its first ever item on UNESCO's intangible cultural heritage list. It's the communist nation's version of the Arirang folk song. According to South Korea's Cultural Heritage Administration, the song was voted onto the list by the UN committee at UNESCO headquarters in Paris on Wednesday local time. The song is officially called the Arirang folk song in the Democratic People's Republic of Korea. Now, both Korea's versions of the song is on this very prestigious list, as South Korea's version was added a couple of years ago. And in the next few days, Nongak, or South Korea's traditional farm music, is expected to become the country's 17th item on the list. Now, Korea's largest annual design fair is open right now for visitors to enjoy in Seoul. This year's focus is all about innovation and creative designs that hopefully improve our lives as well. Our Park ji -won reports. Korea's largest annual design fair features a diverse range of innovative and creative items. For example, all of this modern light equipment is made from 3D printers. And how about this cute ribbon-shaped wine stopper? There are also furniture pieces designed specifically for small studio apartments or one-person homes. And then there's this interior LED light. The shape is inspired by traditional white Korean porcelain pieces, yet its distinctive characteristic is that it's made of a silicon material, which makes for warmer and softer lighting. The design fair not only showcases fresh ideas by up-and-coming designers, it also puts so-called social designs into the spotlight that aim to change society for the better through smart designs. For instance, these products were designed by children facing physical or psychological challenges. All the profits will be spent on their art education. And these pretty flower patterns applied to products like smartphone covers, mugs and T-shirts come from paintings made by victims of Japan's wartime sexual enslavement during art therapy sessions. I thought their paintings could be used for design pieces. Our goal is to have people view and respect them as artists, not merely as victims. They are social issues that fit into the theme of this year's festival, well-aged life, well-balanced design. This year's design festival attempts to see whether designers can provide solutions for creating a healthier society. The 13th annual design fair is expected to draw tens of thousands of visitors during its five-day run that ends Sunday. Park ji Arirang News.
And a good Thursday morning to you all as we kick things off in the KBO where the Kia Tigers and Yang Yanzhong were set to announce their decision on the bid they received by the 28th. But on Wednesday, Kia made an early decision not to accept the bid. Now, although the highest bid was never revealed by the team, it was rumored that the final bid was $1.5 million, which is lower than the $2 million SK Wyverns Kim Gwang Hyun was posted for by the San Diego Padres. And with the Kia Tigers unable to accept a bid that low, the team has rejected the move and their ace will return to the team next season. Now, while Yang Yun Jung will return to the KBO due to the low posting fee, SK Wyvern's third baseman Che Jung received the largest contract in KBO history on Wednesday to stay with the team. With Che Jung considered the biggest name in the free agent market this offseason, many expected his contract to break the 10 billion won mark. And while the contract wasn't as big, he still received the largest contract in KBO history with a four year old deal worth 8.6 billion won, or roughly 7.7 million US dollars. The deal breaks the previous record of 7.5 billion won, or roughly 6.7 million US dollars, the Lotte Giants gave catcher Kang Min Ho last year. And shifting over to the swimming area this time and the ongoing controversy over Soon Yang's doping scandal. Now, after it was reported that he was caught with a banned substance months after the initial date, the World Anti Doping Agency is now stepping in. Now, according to Wana, all athletes who are caught with a banned substance need to be reported within 20 days. However, with reports coming out over six months since the Olympic swimmer tested positive, the agency stated that they never received any reports. Meanwhile, they added that they will further investigate the issue and might take it to the CAS or the Court of Arbitration for sports. All right, moving over to some Wednesday night's KBL action this time. The Busan KT Sonic Boom dominated against the Koyang Orions 95-66 with Charles Rhodes leading the way with 27 points and 9 rebounds. Meanwhile, two Seoul rivals squared off as well as the Seoul Samsung Thunders took on the Seoul SK Knights. And despite SK being a heavy favorite going into the game here, Samsung keeping them close in the first half as SK takes a slim 35-34 lead going into the half. Now, one-point lead continues on going into the fourth quarter of the game, but SK's Aaron Haynes with another big game here, scoring a game-high 21 points as SK hangs on to win this game 72-69. And now finishing things off with some Wednesday night's V-League action this time starting off in the Women's League where the Hanguk Life Insurance Pink Spiders took on the Hyundai Hill State. Now just an absolutely incredible match between the two teams here as Hyundai Hill State takes the first two sets before Pink Spiders come back to take the next two sets including an epic 30-28 fourth set win. But despite the big comeback, Hyundai Hill State's Paulina Romanova leads the way with 43 points in this game as Hyundai Hill State will take the fifth set 15-12 for an epic 3-2 victory. Now, of course, over in the men's side, the Korean Air Jumbos taking on the Kepco Vic Storms. Not as close in this match as Michael Sanchez continues to have a great start to the season, scoring 29 points in a 3-0 win. And that's going to wrap it up for me. This has been SJ. Have a great rest of the day and see you guys again for your sports needs. Good morning. Well, it's hard to believe we are only four days away from December, but still having October-like temperatures. And it seems like mild late autumn weather should continue today. In fact, it's forecast to be slightly milder than yesterday. But people in the Indian region could have a morning fog, so drivers in that area need to be on the roads with extra caution. Otherwise, skies will remain bright. Lots of sun is in store across the nation throughout the day and the top temperatures warm to mid-teens. With that in mind, let's take a closer look at the readings for today. Now, the low in Seoul started out at 6, then the afternoon temperatures will rise to 15, while Daegu Peak at 16, and Gwangju and Busan will top out at 17 this afternoon. Now, let's see how other regions are looking. Jeju Island will be getting up to 17, while Daegu and Tukdu should see a high of 14, and Mount Kungang reaches at 6 this afternoon. Well, that's all for Korea, and here's the international weather for viewers around the world.
Well, those are the stories we have for you at this hour. But Korea Today is coming up with many more stories in about half an hour's time. We'll be back throughout the day here on Arirang TV with many more news updates. Goodbye.